now move on to the last session of our, our ninth annual scientific meeting that's focused on artificial intelligence and transplantation. And so I will uh, welcome back uh, Mamatha Bhatt and Sandra Holdsworth to uh, moderate the session. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Um, Sandra, are you online? Can we see? I am. The oh, perfect. Okay, wonderful. Hi. Okay, excellent. So um, we're going to be co-moderating this session. Um, so Sandra Holdsworth uh, received a liver transplant in 1997 after several years of going undiagnosed with a rare liver and Crohn's disease. Uh, Sandra is a patient partner in Theme 5 and a co-lead uh, of Theme 5 within the CDTRP. Her focus has been on exercise, nutrition, and mental health and wellness, as these are the areas of research that patients and caregivers are interested in seeing done. And so uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Sandra because she has been integral uh, in, this, uh, in this series of projects, uh, particularly uh, the ones that uh, Michael and I are going to speak about. So uh, very happy that uh, we've been able to benefit from her input during the, the course of these projects. So Sandra, Thank you, Mamatha. It's been ahead. a pleasure to work with you and your researchers, and I look forward to sharing your work with everyone else that's there. It's very innovative. Okay, um, so we're going to start off this session with an introduction by myself, followed by two trainee uh, presentations uh, by Michael Cooper uh, and uh, Xiang Gao, uh, and then we'll conclude with an ethical, uh, ethical consideration commentary by Judd Gross uh, and an open question and answer period. So please feel free to type in your questions or raise your virtual hand for people at home and come to the microphone for people in the room at the end of the session. Um, so I'm gonna start off with the introduction um, talk. Uh, so um, let's see here. Okay, perfect. So I'm a staff hepatologist and clinician scientist at the Admira Transplant Program, uh, University Health Network in Toronto. And uh, I'd really like to acknowledge uh, the CDTRP uh, and its uh, uh, support of uh, this work uh, at its uh, inception. Uh, here are my disclosures. So first of all, uh, I'll talk about what is artificial intelligence? What is machine learning? Then we'll talk a bit about why ML and transplantation. And then finally, we'll talk about some case studies in liver transplant and deployment in the clinic. So first of all, what is artificial intelligence? Well, intelligence combines many traits and basically intelligence demonstrated by machines is artificial intelligence. There are many valid definitions, but ultimately uh, we're talking about computer systems that use information and act in a goal-directed manner. What is machine learning itself? So when people talk about AI, they're often referring to machine learning, which is a subset of AI. So it's a field of AI that allows for software applications to become more accurate at generating predictive models without being explicitly programmed. And so this helps us detect hidden patterns and interrelationships that otherwise may not be detected with advanced biostatistical tools. So one can leverage dynamic changes in those different variables over time. Deep learning, which many of you may have heard about, or neural networks uh, are uh, subtypes of ML algorithms or machine learning algorithms. So here are the three main paradigms of machine learning. There's supervised learning, which is predicting diagnoses uh, based on data. There's unsupervised learning, which is learning representations of the data. And then, uh, so like basically, uh, for example, discovering subtypes of a disease from gene expression arrays. And then finally, reinforcement learning, which is dynamic decision making using uh, data. So real time drug dosing practices, for example, to understand the optimal treatment course for a given individual, a given patient. Um, there are certain types of models that one would consider for specific tasks. So for unsupervised learning, uh, you have a variety of uh, different ML tools uh, that one would consider employing. And then for supervised learning, you can see this here. There are different types of, say, regression, as well as classification type tools. 
Um, so why machine learning in transplantation? Well, in transplantation, as many of you are aware, there are so many different factors that will affect um, outcomes and predictions in transplantation. And so sex, ethnicity, genetics, environmental exposures, lifestyle, uh, diabetes, immunosuppression. So there are a variety of things that will impact long-term outcomes. So for example, in uh, liver transplant, there are these different uh, types of patterns, like complex nonlinear patterns that uh, physicians will subconsciously look at and integrate and then say, okay, well, this is the likely diagnosis based on, uh, you know, this is a 25-year-old uh, liver transplant recipient for uh, who received a uh, liver transplant for autoimmune liver disease and now has elevated liver enzymes in this pattern with an ALT greater than AST then, and I recently decreased their immunosuppression so it's very likely that this represents rejection. Like there are certain subconscious things because we keep looking at uh, blood test results or various types of test results and different patterns in clinical care, clinical presentations, we have subconsciously uh, an ML algorithm in our own head to then generate predictions. And there's different types of data that's being generated out there. Uh, so imaging, electronic health record data, histology, uh, clinical sensors, wearables, molecular data. So, so many different types of data. So how does one make sense of that data? Well, ML tools can help in that regard, you know, because there's so much complex data and hidden patterns in that data. And in transplant, uh, there are certain uh, very specific applications. So applications uh, potentially in donor recipient matching, waitlist prioritization, and prediction of post-transplant outcomes so that we can optimize management and optimize the care of uh, our patients. And you can see that there's been an exponential interest in uh, applying machine learning tools, developing such tools to optimize care uh, post-transplant, uh, as you can see in the figure in the lower right. So um, this is a figure from a recent uh, publication, actually, uh, with other CDTRP members. So this was with the support of CDTRP that we uh, published this uh, particular um, uh, review on this, the landscape of machine learning in transplantation, whether it's for, uh, again, like donor recipient matching or prediction of outcomes. There are different types of tools that one can use for those specific clinical questions, and one can even even develop such tools. So in collaboration with uh, computer science experts, so such as uh, Michael and uh, uh, Shang's uh, supervisor with whom uh, I very closely collaborate. So I'll give you a few case examples in liver transplantation uh, where we've uh, published. So um, the care of liver transplant patients uh, post-transplant uh, is really uh, you know, an area where I think there's a lot of research uh, that needs to be done and uh, that we can do a lot of work to optimize uh, post-transplant uh, survival. So uh, the question always comes up, like how do we best manage and balance the benefits versus risks of over versus under immunosuppression. And uh, we know that in the liver transplant patient population over the last 30 years, despite the fact that we use the least immunosuppression, we haven't had dramatic improvements in long-term survival beyond a year. So how can we optimize that? And, uh, you know, I found in my practice that there was very limited evidence to guide the optimal care of an individual patient. So like, how can I do better in the liver transplant clinic to optimize the care of my specific patient? So this is a paper that we published last year in collaboration with Bo Wang, uh, co-senior author, and uh, this was led by two uh, enthusiastic trainees. So we published this in Lancet Digital Health last year uh, to predict mortality due to uh, or predict long-term survival due to long-term complications after liver transplantation. And so we use different types of algorithms to look at the different types of data, uh, longitudinal data, and we wanted to better understand how we could optimize uh, care post-transplant. So we used 
the scientific registry of transplant recipients, uh, which offered us a wealth of data and uh, a number of clinical variables, so over 200 clinical variables, 267, and we predicted overall uh, survival, and then overall, uh, you know, what were the different types of complications that uh, we needed to predict to optimize outcomes. And with the SRTR, uh, we found that the best performing model was the transformer model, uh, which was a type of deep uh, machine learning algorithm. And uh, we um, had an area under the survival uh, uh, area under the rock curve of uh, 0.774 for overall survival at one year, but then uh, heart uh, uh, complications, cardi uh, graft uh, issues, cancer and infection, those uh, were associated with AUCs of between 0 0.804 to 0 0.814. And this was in comparison to logistic regression. And then we also were able to to predict a five-year time frame. And then we validated that those results in the UHN data set to then uh, ensure that there was good validation of uh, this particular algorithm. And actually, it validated pretty well. However, the predictive features or the predictive variables varied between the SRTR and the UHN data set, but the algorithm continued to perform quite well uh, in the UHN uh, data set. So the idea here is then to use this to better inform uh, the care of a given individual in your clinical practice to optimize and determine, you know, what are the modifiable things that I could uh, improve upon in my practice to optimize uh, long-term survival after transplant? Because right now, as I said, we don't have any clear guidance in that regard. So um, there are various steps in terms of deployment of machine learning and AI tools in the clinic. And uh, one is, you know, number one is starting off with the exploration of a clinical problem. Then you have solution design. So in collaboration with computer scientists, and then ultimately implementation, having done an environmental survey and doing some silent testing of that algorithm in comparison to standard of care to see if you can, you know, help your given patient in the transplant clinic. And, uh, you know, what we can do with such tools is also like update those predictions at different intervals after transplant. So uh, this is a dashboard uh, example. So we have developed this dashboard in collaboration with the chief data scientist at UHN to now say, okay, well, we are going to feed all the different variables that are available and have these generate predictions. And so then we can determine what are the features, what are the variables that we could then modify to improve uh, a given individual's care. And we, we have done this in collaboration with the hepatologists as well as the clinical research coordinators at our center. So we're getting ready for clinical deployment in the next few months uh, based on this. And we are also going to then ensure that we can develop a patient-facing dashboard that would, uh, you know, help um, people feel empowered in their care to optimize uh, their long-term um, outcomes and long-term survival. So, uh, for example, as seen here, you have this list of different factors that are predictive of uh, outcomes post-transplant. So uh, this is another project uh, that is now uh, in the process of publication to predict graft fibrosis or scarring of the liver after liver transplantation, again, using longitudinal data. And uh, this is also a relatively well-performing algorithm with an AUC of 0.798. Uh, and it performs actually comparably to uh, what's called the transient elastogram, which is a tool that we use in the transplant clinic to detect scarring of the liver. And what could we do with that knowledge? Well, we could then uh, decide, well, we need to perform a liver biopsy to then get a better sense as to what's going on in the liver and how we could optimize a person's immunosuppression. Um, this is a, an example of successful clinical deployment in the transplant arena and uh, comes from uh, Alexandre Lupi in Paris. Uh, so I won't get into the details of this too much because uh, I'm running out of time. I've run out of time. Uh, but this is actually a wonderful example of deployment of an AI tool in the, liver, in the kidney transplant arena uh, where uh, the algorithm actually had this excellent C index of 0.81 in both derivatives 
motivation and validation cohorts and predicting uh, graft outcomes. And so really, I think in the end, uh, I think uh, AI and machine learning holds great promise to really personalize the care of liver transplant patients for sure, as well as other transplant patients. And really it leverages that dynamics in data, the interrelationships, the hidden patterns in complex data, and really requires large data sets to inform those predictions. And uh, I think you know the next frontier is really clinical deployment and uh, there are steps uh, that have been taken uh, in the recent years to really enable that, but uh, it's still something that people are working on across medicine, but really it holds promise to optimize uh, care uh, and help both uh, you know, physicians take uh, the best possible care of their patients, as well as patients to feel empowered in their care to uh, you know, have personalized ideas of how they can improve um, their long-term health. And so I'd like to acknowledge my key collaborators and uh, research team and acknowledge these funding sources, uh, particularly the CDTRP and a CIHR uh, bridge grant that we received uh, for this work uh, last, uh, last year. So thanks so much for your attention. And now we'll move on to Michael Cooper's presentation. So uh, Michael Cooper is uh, a PhD student studying computer science at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Rahul Krishnan and Michael Brudno. Um, and uh, his research centers around applying methods from machine learning to problems in healthcare and current line of work leverages machine learning to improve our organ allocation and pre-transplant outcomes in liver transplant patients. And so uh, we've been working closely on this project that he's going to present to you today. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here. I'm Michael, and today I'm going to be talking about Dynameld, Accurate Equitable Modeling of End-Stage Liver Disease. Many of us in this room are familiar with the MELD sodium. The MELD sodium is an equation that's used to assess a patient's risk of mortality as they're awaiting liver transplant. It is a function of four biological variables, and it produces a number between 6 and 40 that is used to allocate deceased donor organs for transplant on the basis of patient need. Patients with higher meld sodium scores receive earlier access to deceased donor transplant livers because they have less time to wait on the wait list before they die of liver failure. The question that I'm motivating this, that I want to use to motivate this talk, though, is is the meld sodium the best possible score? Because if I were to make this claim to you, there's a couple of reasons why we should doubt this to be the case. The first, is that in the decades since the MELD coefficients were first calculated, we've seen a shift in the underlying distribution of patients who are waitlisted for liver transplant. We now see fewer patients with hepatitis C as an indicator for transplant, and we see more patients with NASH cirrhosis and alcoholic liver disease. It is unclear that the existing MELD coefficients represent the best risk score for the current cohort of patients. Additionally, the meld sodium takes on a linear functional form, and it is unclear that a linear equation is best able to capture complex relationships between patient variables as they relate to pre-transplant mortality risk. And finally, the meld sodium score has been found to disadvantage female patients. Recent work found that women allocated for liver transplant under the meld sodium score were 8.6% more likely to die awaiting liver transplantation than their male counterparts when accounting for other factors. To approach this problem, we're going to apply methods from machine learning to attempt to improve upon the meld sodium score. And machine learning, as Mamta said, refers to the class of methods that broadly learn equations from data to accurately model phenomena that we observe in data sets. And the specific class of machine learning that we deal with in this work called deep learning excels at learning complex relationships from observed data. Deep learning in the past has been very good at classifying skin lesions as benign or malignant from image data as input. It's able to perform object recognition in complex scenes, and in very exciting recent work, it's even able to generate images based on textual descriptions. That's right, the image on the right hand of the slide is not a photograph nor produced by a human illustrator, it's generated by a machine learning model in response to the text that we see above the image of a giraffe making a funny face. So why might this be a promising line of work for us to pursue now? Well, unlike in the past, 
we have access to a significant data repository in the form of the SRTR, as well as additional data that we have on site at UHN where I do my research. If we're able to learn a nonlinear complex risk function that's able to account for a large diversity of patient disease trajectories, there might also be the potential for deep learning to provide a unified system of risk assessment that spans subcomorbidities rather than relying on meld exception points. And finally, and the most exciting motivation for me behind this work, is that we have the potential to reduce pre-transplant mortality without making any changes to the supply of organs if we're able to learn a superior risk estimator to the meld sodium. For this study, our data consists of 121,000 patients who were listed for transplant in the United States between 2002 and 2021. We limit ourselves to adult patients with decompensated cirrhosis who are listed without exception points. And for each patient, we collect 342 static and time-varying covariates describing their state when they are listed for transplant and the trajectory of their disease evolution over time. Our patients on average are 53.3 years old, our cohorts 40% female, they have a meld sodium at listing just above 22, and they are most commonly listed for various types of cirrhosis as their indicators for transplant. The model that we use to attempt to model this data and predict risk is called the Cox Proportional Hazards Model, which performs linear survival analysis. It accepts as input some patient data, it learns a linear function of risk over that data, and then it produces a patient risk score. This is the means by which the meld sodium score was computed. We additionally use an algorithm called DeepServe, which leverages deep neural networks to perform nonlinear survival analysis. It accepts as input patient data, learns a deep neural network nonlinear risk function over the data to produce a patient risk score. For the rest of this presentation, we're going to use the word DynaMeld to describe our variant of the DeepServe model. DynaMeld, in addition to the standard variables, takes into account rate of change covariates to better predict the trajectories and rate of change of patients, uh, of patient biological markers as they're on the wait list over time. To evaluate our method, we use a statistic called the time-dependent concordance index. This statistic roughly corresponds to the correspondence between a list of patients ordered by their risk score and that same list of patients ordered by their observed time of death in the data. If these lists match perfectly, this means your model is perfect at discriminating relative risk, and therefore you earn a concordance index of one. If the risk scores that you assign are at random with respect to the observed times of death in the cohort, you earn a concordance index of 0.5. And if the estimated risk scores that your model assigns are the inverse of the observed times of death, your model is doing very, very badly and you earn yourself a concordance index of zero. If it helps with the intuition, this is similar to the area under the receiver operating curve for right censored patients. The results on our held out validation data are shown in this plot. On the x-axis, we have the number of days from listing that the patient has been on the wait list. On the y-axis, we show their time-dependent concordance index over the cohort of patients that has remained on the wait list for that period of time. The yellow line at the bottom is the concordance index achieved by the MELD sodium score. The purple line is that achieved by the MELD 3.0, a more recent update to the MELD sodium score that is currently proposed for clinical consideration. The linear Cox proportional hazards model is shown in blue, and our DynaMeld algorithm achieves the highest time-dependent concordance index shown by the green line. Statistical two-sample testing shows that this relationship is significant, and we achieve higher time-dependent concordance index than the MELD sodium. So, I've told you what DynaMeld might mean for patients in the aggregate, but what might DynaMeld mean for an individual patient on the wait list? Because this has been a theme of today's meeting. First, I want to consider the case of a 63-year-old female NASH patient who is listed for transplant. On the x-axis, I show the number of days from listing for that patient, and on the y-axis, I show her risk percentile relative to the cohort on the wait list at that time. This corresponds to the percent of patients listed at that time who have a lower risk score than the patient in question. As you can see, DynaMeld places this patient from the get-go into a much higher risk percentile over the course of her care. This affords her a materially higher chance at receiving a liver transplant as she is waiting. Unfortunately, this patient ended up dying after 160 days on the wait list, and had she been allocated under DynaMeld, we might conjecture that she would have had a higher chance of attracting a deceased donor transplant organ during her wait list period. 
We can similarly consider the case of this 54-year-old female PBC patient for whom Dynamelt placed her into a higher risk percentile over the course of her care than the melt sodium. She also died after 156 days on the wait list, and had she been allocated under Dynamelt, she may have had a higher chance of attracting a deceased donor transplant organ. These examples aren't at random. They represent the types of patients who the meld sodium historically underserves, and we hope that Dynameld may provide better standards of care for these patients as they're awaiting transplantation. So we talked about training Dynameld on 342 features. Which ones are the most important? When we use the method of Shapley values, which is an experimental method because this general field is an open area of machine learning research, to evaluate the relative significance of features in our model, we see that known clinical features that are already incorporated into the meld sodium tend to have the greatest significance relative to their peers. However, Dynameld learns a representation over many features, placing non-trivial significance on a lot of the features within our data set. To us, this indicates that the question of predicting pre-transplant risk is much more complicated than the meld sodium would expect you to believe, and complex models of more variables may stand to do a much better job on this task in the future. We lastly evaluate our model using LiveSim, which is an organ allocation simulation program. LiveSim accepts as input a data set of patient information, as well as, a risk, as well as an organ allocation policy in the form of a risk score. LiveSim then runs a simulation of allocating organs to those patients over time and produces a series of summary statistics that we can use to assess how many people would have died over the course of the simulation and their demographics. When we run our model through LiveSim on a cohort of 16,000 patients who have been listed for transplant since the introduction of the meld sodium in the United States, we see that Dynameld drops the rate of pre-transplant mortality from 7.9% to 6.9%, which ends up saving 163 lives in this cohort without making any changes to the supply of organs. When we look at just the female partition of our data, we find that Dynameld reduces the rate of pre-transplant mortality in women from 8.1% to 6.9%, saving 82 lives and now having a rate of pre-transplant mortality that matches that of the general population. Once again, I wanna emphasize that these gains come with no change to the supply of organs, purely with a better risk assessment on the demand side. Our work is not without its limitations. Admittedly, in deep neural network models, it is harder to interpret their findings, and it is more difficult to understand why decisions are being made the way that they are. It is additionally computationally costly to train these models, which may prove a challenge as we go to incorporate these models into a clinical dashboard for assessment. As next steps, we consider training on a wider diversity of data, including incorporating patients with exception points into our cohort. Thank you so much. I want to acknowledge our funders for this work, a CIHR Bridge Grant and a Health Systems Impact Fellowship. And at the end, I'm really happy to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Michael. And so we're now we'll move on to uh, Shang. Uh, Shang Gao is currently entering his uh, final year of undergraduate studies in data science at the University of Toronto and Vector Institute, where he is supervised by Dr. Rahul Krishnan. His research lies at the intersection of machine learning and healthcare. His goal is to build an in-depth understanding of over-parameterized models, construct reliable learning algorithms that generalize to out-of-distribution environments, and eventually create autonomous agents for clinical decision-making. Shank, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, uh, so today I'll present our work on building survival models to predict uh, long-term liver graft failure. Um, and uh, liver graft failure arises in 25% of the transplant recipients, and uh, it can severely impact the health of the transplant recipients and can lead to uh, mortality or a need for uh, retransplantation. Uh, and currently, uh, we don't really have a standard tool or method to assess this long-term risk. And if we have a good model that can give um, individualized, accurate uh, risk estimates of these long-term risks, uh, we can provide guidance on proactive treatment and care uh, to physicians and prevent the disease to continue to progress. And a lot of the previous work on building predict prediction tool for liver graft failure focused on uh, the space of early graft dysfunction or short-term graft failure, uh, where you have 
uh, tools where monitor patients uh, days after the transplant or even use that predictive outcomes to do better donor recipient matching. But in this work, uh, we more focused on, on the long-term prediction uh, where we use um, patient follow-up data uh, potentially years after the transplant uh, to predict their risk of graft failure. And there has been a um, tremendous success of applying machine learning to different fields over the last decade, uh, from you know, computer vision in autonomous driving uh, to generating these photorealistic images by giving prompts. And we can play, uh, we can be human champions in some of these uh, most complicated games by using machine learning models. And the core of these algorithms is really just to try to uh, find useful patterns and complex relationships uh, from large amount of high dimensional input data. And these used to be very difficult uh, due to limited computation and uh, lack of scalable methods. And with more patient data available, it is natural to use these large scale and data-driven methods uh, to build risk assessment tools in clinical settings instead of just relying on uh, human expertise or human created risk rules. Uh, so to train our models, uh, we use uh, this SRTR data set, uh, Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients, uh, where we have uh, 83,000 patients extracted uh, between 2002 and 2021. And this data set contains uh, 11 different regions across the United States and many different transplant centers uh, within them. So we choose this data set uh, for model development due to its large sample size and the diversity of data sources. And in addition, uh, we have access to this UHN data set in Toronto that has about 3,000 uh, recipients uh, data that we can use for direct external validation. So the key difference here is that we're not gonna do any part of model training or model tuning on this UHN data set. Uh, we sort of re reserve it and save it until the very end of the model development to uh, best validate our, our best models on the SRTR data set. And from the SRTR data set, we have over you know, 200 wearables in total from both pre and post transplant. These are static and dynamic uh, changes in demographics, clinical and lab test wearables. And for the UHN data set, uh, we only extracted six wearables. Uh, I'm gonna show you which of the six these wearables are and why did we choose them. But in total, there's less than hundred. And even within that hundred wearables, there were, there's a very small overlap between the two data sets, which presents a challenge of how do you transfer uh, a model that's trained on the SRTR data set to other, potentially other regions or other hospitals. So we trained a variety of machine learning models that have a varying degree of uh, complexity, going from the simplest one that you have seen from the previous uh, presentation, the Cox regression model, uh, place a strong assumption that your output, your time to graph failure is actually uh, just a linear combination of your inputs. And extending from that, we have uh, deep serve and deep head. These are sort of multi-layers. They have multi-layers of parameters um, to model potentially a nonlinear relationship between your input and your output. And finally, we have this transformer model, which is the backbone of many of the state-of-the-art systems these days. And you can see there's little modules of neural networks uh, put together in a smart way. So they have way more parameters that they can take in sequential data to model temporal trends uh, between the patient trajectory. And finally, we also have this random survival force. Essentially, they are uh, decision rules composing together. And if you have enough of these rules, and these models are actually as powerful as these neural network-based models. Uh, so, we use the same evaluation metrics as uh, my, in Michael's project. This time-dependent concordance index is really just a C index that you can uh, calculate across different time points. And it goes from zero to one, where one, you have a perfect model that can give, a, you know, if the model gives high risk, then that patient should have shorter time to failure due to the high risk. And we evaluate uh, the C index across different time points because we want to apply this model uh, to different follow-up time, not just at a single uh, time point, for example, one year after transplant, but also maybe five or 10 years after transplant. And this Delta T can control our uh, 
you know, we can take a look at the performance of the model by going into maybe predicting 10 year uh, graph failure prediction or five year graph failure prediction. Uh, so we also did some feature selections uh, just to address uh, the previous issue I mentioned on transferring the model. So here we take the SRTR data set and we train a regularized linear Cox model. Uh, because the model is linear, we can easily take out the linear coefficients and take a look at what's the highly correlated risk factors uh, associated with um, the graph failure uh, of the patients. And you can see with some of the top uh, risk factors are simply the biological uh, variables of the patient. And we select subset of them. And here's our results on the SRTR data set. Where essentially there are two sets, of, two sets of results, one based on the subset we selected, which only have six covariates and the other have uh, the entire set of over 200 features. And you can see there's not too much difference uh, between using any of uh, the feature set. Uh, at, there's at most like 2% uh, performance difference. And here, uh, the Cox model, the simple model, and the complex model transformer actually got the same results. And uh, the best performing model here, DeepHead, achieves a concordance of A to 8. And you might conclude that, OK, DeepHead here is the, our model of choice. We should deploy this model. But if you evaluate this, these line models on the UHN data set, uh, you observe that deep hit went from the best model to, to the worst model on the UHN data set, whereas the simple model, Cox, uh, the Cox regression models, uh, achieved the best generalization results on the UHN data set. So based on this results, uh, uh, we present our main model, model for allograph survival. This is based on the same uh, linear Cox model you've seen from the previous slide. And since it's a linear, uh, you can write out them as an equation, as a risk score. Um, it's simple and interpretable uh, of the six uh, bio biological variables and the units here are uh, normalized. So the coefficients are just relative importance of them. Uh, so to our knowledge, there's uh, not really, uh, we are, this is a first score that's targeting at predicting long-term graph failure. So there's not much direct baselines that we can use, but we still include uh, some of the relevant scores like the metal score here. Uh, to give a comparison on, on the SRTR data set. And uh, going a step further, uh, we also uh, trained, uh, we take the features that the MELT score takes. Uh, instead of using the uh, original definitions of the MELT, we uh, train the MELT on our local data. We train, the, we train them on our data set locally. And uh, still, in this case, uh, our model still consistently outperform the other baselines. Uh, I'm only showing five-year prediction, but also uh, based on our results, one-year, uh, three-year, and 10-year prediction, uh, we still see this, uh, our model can uh, consistently outperform the baselines. Uh, so in, just in conclusion, uh, we, develop, we develop a simple risk score for predicting long-term uh, graph failure, and it has a good results both in distribution on the SRTR data set, and also generalized well uh, to all of distribution data set that it have, may not have seen during the training. And you see that uh, choosing a good model can be tricky. Sometimes you can have uh, misleading conclusions. Uh, it depends on the choice of your model and the choice of your data set that you, you evaluate on. So it's really important before deployment of these models, you have a complete evaluations of their robustness and fairness. And also uh, beyond uh, linearity, we show that linear functions here are uh, simple, are good, they get good results, but uh, I believe that we can create better machine learning methods that encode uh, domain knowledge as priors uh, to achieve even better results than what we showed here. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, hey, thanks so much, Shen. Uh, those were great presentations. Uh, so we have the two computer scientists uh, <laughs> at the meeting on the podium here. Um, so I think we'll um, uh, conclude uh, the session uh, with uh, Jed's presentation and then a question and answer period. Uh, so Jed Gross is a member of the bioethics program at UHN in Toronto, where his clinical practice supports the work of UHN's Ajmera Transplant Center. He also advises organizations engaged in transplant governance. 
including Trillium Gift of Life Network and CSA Group. His scholarly publications bring comparative historical and legal insights in, to bear on the policy changes challenges associated with biomedical innovation. So thanks so much, Jed, for joining us and uh, look forward to your uh, talk. Thanks. I've been asked to comment on this project from an ethical perspective. Given the history of biomedical ethics, it's understandable that some people may view ethics input primarily as a kind of compliance checkbox. We're aiming for more than that here. I've been engaged with the research team in Toronto as they've refined their proposal and applied for funding because we're seeking to ensure that the use of machine learning and transplant fulfills its potential for a positive stakeholder impact. In thinking about the ethical implications of this project, it may be useful to make a distinction between goals and the means of achieving them. The goals here are at least twofold. First, there's an opportunity to use this information to improve patients' understanding of their own health. There may be factors contributing to mortality that are modifiable and in liver recipients, some of the most important drivers of life expectancy may not be directly related to the liver or immunosuppression. As long as we share personal health data in a respectful way, the ability to share information that is simultaneously more personalized and more holistic will likely be welcomed as a way of enhancing people's health and capacity for self-determination, both pre- and post-transplant. Second, to the extent that mortality risk gets incorporated into the process of allocating livers or other organs as they become available, it has the potential to expand access to transplantation in a way that is both fair and a net gain. The ethics of organ allocation is often framed as a balance between utility, roughly defined as squeezing the most good from the supply of donated organs, and equity defined as something like um, broad access for those who stand to benefit without discrimination. Defining both of these concepts is philosophically contentious, but the broad underlying assumption is that there's a trade-off between utility and equity. What this research appears to show is that that's not always the case. To use an overly simplistic model, if we equate utility with maximizing life years gained, prioritizing patients with the greatest mortality risk could simultaneously benefit those who are disadvantaged by less sophisticated allocation criteria and increase the overall net benefit. Historically, efforts to optimize equity and transplantation have existed, but they've been relatively blunt. For example, if we think a criterion like sodium meld has an unjust disparate impact on female patients, we could eliminate that criterion completely or re reweight our use of it in some way. But machine learning seems to practically open up a much wider field of play for generating risk assessments that are more accurate and better calibrated to achieve a win-win outcome. Of course, this is a nuanced claim, but to avoid monopolizing the remaining time, I'd like to take a measured look at what might be called deployment. The field of AI ethics is still emergent, but to the extent that we can anticipate, that's where some of the critical questions may arise. First, transparency and legibility are generally virtues in clinical care. Although liver patients are probably aware that they are living with risk from day to day, dynamic numbers based on changing intelligence may be more difficult to explain than simpler but less accurate predictions. To the extent that these numbers affect access and prioritization, we're introducing them into a system that not everyone trusts right now. In light of this, what would it mean to make the underlying population level data and or the algorithms publicly accessible for review and input? What sort of participant authorization might that require? Secondly, beyond um, coding errors and such technical um, slips, is there such a thing as an error in this approach? There's been a general move in North American healthcare toward thinking of medical errors as predictable artifacts of learning healthcare systems. Many of my colleagues in the legal academy, however, still think about error in terms of lapses due to negligence, individual accountability, and compensation for discrete harms. When patients' lives are on the line, how do we explain evolving predictive algorithms and the practical consequences of using them? 
if the numbers are going to affect the timing of organ offers and patients start making plans around this, do they develop some kind of reliance interest while on the wait list that we would want to accommodate even if the algorithm changes? Finally, the biggest practical challenge may simply be figuring out how to incorporate this technology into existing allocation systems. Here in Ontario, the OPO is increasingly integrated into a public agency called Ontario Health. The situation is likely similar with Alberta Health Services, et cetera. We've said that the use of mortality risk scores can potentially increase both equity and utility, but they don't capture every relevant consideration and allocation. As a result, deployment beyond counseling individual patients is likely going to necessitate the involvement of public policy mechanisms to determine how this risk information that's generated by the AI is integrated with other factors like wait time and geography. By highlighting these questions, I don't mean to imply in any way that they're insurmountable, just that we need to bring our empathetic imagination and human intelligence to them. On that note, I'm going to turn the mic over to Sandra Holdsworth. Thanks, Jed. It's always interesting to hear your uh, insights and in, uh, you really actually speak on behalf of many patients um, and how we're feeling as well. So first off, uh, the research that's being done in machine learning, I think is very innovative and I think it's great. I think it also leads towards um, you use the word personalized, so I was thinking more precision medicine and looking at us as individuals because we're not all the same. And um, I, when I had my transplant, we didn't have even have the mouse score. So I'm wondering how I would have benefit because I was could have been one of those women that passed away. And that's why you'll see patients seeking a cure PSC being involved because this is what we're finding. So I think that that, that is great as well. I also think too, when it comes to um, sharing the dashboard that was presented and when it goes into clinicians and when we start education patient ed education patients about this, I think that we got to realize that patients do understand that there is a mortality issue, right? Because we lived with our illnesses for so long. We know that transplant's not a cure, but I think it would be better for us to have this data and this information so that we can work with our transplant teams to see how we can change our way that we're going if there's something that we can change to make our graph last longer. So, you know, but I also think that, as you said, there's a lot of things to consider, but I kudos to uh, Mammoth's team and the, the researchers and, you know, it's, it's great. And uh, thank you, I'll leave it for the rest to ask any questions. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, uh, for those thoughts. Um, I, I think uh, you know your your perspectives have been invaluable uh, to the progress of this uh, of this work as well as Jed's. So we really uh, appreciate all the input you've had. Um, are there any questions from the floor or in the chat that we can address? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. So clearly the machine learning is a fascinating approach to manage massive amounts of data and obtaining accurate conclusions. But in all the projects that you have presented, uh, they employ cohorts of thousands and thousands of patients. Yes. So my question is, which is the lower limit in the number of patients to use this tool? So it's possible to benefit from the unsupervised data in a cohort of 40 patients, but with 300 data on 300 parameters in each patient? Yes, yes, so that's a great question. Uh, do you want to address that question, Michael? Sure, um, that, yeah, that's an ex excellent question. Um, the two, so two main factors that will additionally affect how well your machine learning model works on fewer patients is the complexity of the model class. So if you're trying to learn a linear Cox model, you'll probably do pretty well on a couple of hundred patients. If you're trying to learn a transformer model like Xiang was using, you'll probably have a lot more trouble. Um, and the other factor is it's affected by the number of variables that you have in your data set. Because if you have more variables, it's harder to learn an accurate predictive function from fewer patients. There's a funny saying in machine learning where we refer to this as the curse of dimensionality, where as your data set includes more variables, it's more difficult to learn. 
Thank you. So there isn't, it's difficult to say, define that lower limit, I think, in the end. But say if you have a lot of data and longitudinal data on even a smaller group of patients, it is possible to train a model, like a simplistic model. But as Michael mentioned, like say a transformer model or like a deep machine learning model uh, may, may have uh, difficulty getting trained on that kind of data. But certainly we have seen, you know, like uh, papers or studies with a smaller number of patients and like tons of omics data, layers of omics data, then, you know, uh, allowing uh, prediction of certain outcomes. Yes, uh, Leonard. Um, really interesting. I I'm, I'm like a, have a computer science background and I just love what oh, AI nice. has the potential to do. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, first question is you, you have hundreds of input parameters. Um, does that include things like ethnicity, uh, location, you know, relative mm -hmm. to the hospital, that type of thing? Um, so that's question number one. Uh, and that has some ethical implications, of course. Uh, question number two, Sandra sort of touched on it, was is, is this, is it, is it likely, is it, is it possible that you can, you know, run this algorithm continuously with you know, dynamic data as, yes. as people come in and, yes. and they get another blood test and, and, and oh, wait a minute, you yeah. maybe should. So it be refines that prediction. You know? Correct. Yeah. Okay. It keeps refining that prediction. So for example, for uh, Dynameld or for the other paper uh, that we had published last year on the post-transplant predictions, um, these were all uh, based on dynamic variables, changes, uh, rates of change uh, over time such that you had updated predictions. So like say for the post-transplant uh, complication prediction, uh, say you had a, a patient at four years or at eight years, you could then give them a one-year and five-year assessment of their you know, cardiovascular risk or cancer risk. And like, what can we do to improve that? Because right now, Unfortunately, uh, you know, it's very difficult to give any sort of assessment or proper guidance to an individual patient. It's really like we're treating everyone mostly like a, you know, although based on experience, you know, you will try to optimize for a given individual. Uh, it's not necessarily based on strong evidence because a lot of transplant is observational studies uh, and, you know, very limited clinical trials, at least in liver transplant. It's, it's quite limited, uh, the sort of clinical trial-based uh, uh, evidence. So, um, you know, uh, we, we have the opportunity now to even prox prospectively assess the performance of these algorithms to say, you know, like, can we uh, decrease the rate of admission? at least, you know, like, or the rate of events, like with these predictions, by modifying those modifiable risk factors, you know, like if I decrease or increase the immunosuppression by this percentage, I will be able to decrease the cardiovascular risk by this percentage. So we can give that sort of prediction. And this is really based on, say, multiple patients in that SRTR and then validation in the UHN data set. But it's like, say, one person is a composite of uh, different people in those large data sets. Or they could be a, a digital twin of, you know, someone in uh, that data set also. So we use that to then inform those predictions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Tom. This is, it's really nice work. Um, I think the, the question, I have two questions, but the, I'll, the first one really has, is more technical in terms of uh, the importance of really understanding what are the associations that you're finding and what explains this association? Because the most important variables mm. that come up on your list may not be themselves causally, causally linked to what you're looking at, but may represent something else. And it's just, that's the best mm -hmm. way to configure it. And the, the, one of the best examples of this was a, an online uh, job application tool that was uh, being used to uh, assess uh, using AI, the quality of a candidate. And there was a long questionnaire, but the, the characteristic that actually was the best determinant of the success of the candidate was the web browser that they were using to fill out the application, right? And so that in, contained within that information, there was obviously a whole bunch of other information about the person and the type of person and their access to electronics and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, what's key there is to understand, well, what, what is it about that? And then the second part of that is once that becomes known, 
Now, of course, all the job applicants are going to change to the more modern version of the web browser, and your your tool now becomes irrelevant because under knowing how the algorithm works then changes how the algorithm yes. is used. And so it is really important that when we're developing these algorithms, yeah. you know, the one that looks like look, the one that listed, you know, AST and ALT and Villarubin and, and renal function. I understand why all of those things would be strong predictors of, yes. graft, of graft outcome. Yeah. But you know, you had a really long list of things that had nothing to do with that in terms of your 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 meld prediction. And so the caution in there is that it it is worth the effort to go deep and understand what is it about mm -hmm. all those other features mm -hmm. that really is is outweighing the clinical features that you would think would otherwise be more important. Mm -hmm. It's probably, mm -hmm. it's, it's not gonna be an easy question to answer, but it comes to the sort of the whole, how people trust the black box. Yes. And people don't trust the black box. They don't, you know, they don't trust that, you know, you know the machine said that we're gonna do X. Um, they really wanna understand why did that, why did they come to that conclusion? So I would yeah. just yeah. think as, a, as it comes to, um, this reminds me actually a lot of the organ donation side and how we moved to organ donor specialists and we trained up transplant coordinators who are specialized in asking families. A lot of it is, is a lot of this is about communicating the information mm. to physicians and from teams to patients so that they understand it properly. Mm -hmm. And I think these are the types of things that are actually going to build that trust both from the provider side and from the patient side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Thank you for that uh, comment, Tom. I think, uh, you know, Michael, can you, uh, we were talking about this yesterday, so. <laughs> yeah, like I, in general, I agree with everything you've said. Um, these are like, excellent points that I, I think so. So I think there's sort of two things I want to say. Um, one is in my mind, I think sort of for the future of the Dynamel work, there's actually merit in building a couple of different versions that use different sets of variables. One, for example, might be biological variables that clinicians know relate to the outcome and seeing whether a nonlinear function over those does better. And then incorporating some of the other features like up to the 342 that I talked about here, I expect that will give better predictive power, but it might be learning a lot of spurious correlations, which you know like might get iffy and also sort of reduce trust. So I think that is a question that we need to resolve before deployment. Um, the second point that I want to make is I think there's there's starting to come about in the machine learning literature, but this is very early research um, on what's called ca called causal machine learning, where the idea is that if you have some variables that you conjecture are related and you have some additional confounding variables, your machine learning model can attempt to adjust for the effects of confounders and learn only those variables that are causally related. Um, I think once the statistics in this area reach a high degree of maturity, I believe that's sort of where the future of a lot of these things need to go because then at least in medicine, you can point to the causal effect being there so that clinicians and patients can feel that degree of trust that the model's making good predictions rather than learning spurious correlations. Okay, thank you. We'll take one last question. And it's uh, from Donna in the chat. Oh, okay, great. Donna, please go ahead. Hello. As a PBC transplant recipient, I am greatly um, interested in your research. And I would just like to know, how does it compare with other diseases? Would not more data points give you more, more information to make it more fair in predicting for more liver diseases? Yeah, so uh, so like we all we all know that I'm not a clinician, so do take what okay. I'm about to say next with an appropriate <laughs> degree of caution. Um, but it's <laughs> but it's my understanding that the way the system works is you have your sort of meld sodium score, and then based on your condition, you get these exception points that sort of like adjust somewhat based on your degree of evolution in a way that may not be captured by the meld score. And like the the answer to your question is like is yes, when you have more data over a wider trajectory of diseases, uh, your machine learning model should be able to learn with greater accuracy the way that those diseases evolve relative to say the meld sodium. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm quite excited about with this work is if this model is able to effectively capture these trajectories of a lot of different diseases, it might be actually able to adjust for diseases in a way that isn't even captured by meld sodium exception points. Um, I think a full analysis of how this like goes with different diseases is still an active area of our work, um, but it's definitely something that is worthwhile to tie up before we submit a paper on this because that's like definitely something that we should consider. 
I, great. That's fabulous. Um, <laughs> as, as a female who is, like I said, I had PBC AIH overlap and I, mm -hmm. I was listed at what, uh, 16 meld and I was transplanted at 22, 23. And I was only listed for three weeks. And wow. my meld was jumping by two points in three days. So I think this would be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Uh, my next question is, how soon would you see it being able to be implemented in real life, like even in silent mode? This is a, uh, I, I sort of hesitate to put a timeline on a lot of these things as a, uh, because like, um, I think in silent mode, that sort of depends on the rate at which we can get some initial validation done with our collaborators at UHN. Um, so I'm optimistic within the next like year or two, we can have some version of that in silent trial at UHN. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, one thing with like clinical products is whenever you think about deploying them, they need to be so, so safe. And that's why I often joke that doing machine learning for healthcare is like doing machine learning on hard mode, because you actually need your stuff to work all the time, which isn't the case if you're, say, doing content or advertising recommendations. Um, and so I think there's <laughs> there's definitely a trade-off here where like, we want to, like, we, we want to, like, there's intense promise with this stuff. But I think as Jed and Sandra point out, there's a lot of safety issues. And we need to be really, really sure that this works because like, as one of the things that I've taken away from this conference a lot more emotionally is like people's allocations are a huge determinant of the way that they live their lives. And we need to make sure that since these machine learning models may have such an outsized impact on people's lives, that they need to work really well. And that's like something that I very much am conscious of, but we need to make sure of that before we put it out into production where it's making real decisions. Okay. Exactly. Great. Just just a note. Um, I was transplanted on a Saturday. I got the call on a Friday. I was going to go away the Thursday for the long weekend. And I woke up feeling horrible and I had jumped two meld points. So the fact I stayed home is the reason I'm alive. Wow. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Donna, for your for your comment and uh, question. And uh, I think you know what what has been interesting in this uh, collaboration is that um, you know we've all learned from each other. Like, say, you know, having these regular meetings, interdisciplinary uh, meetings, has been very helpful for both sides. You know, so for the computer scientists in our team and the clinical you know, fellow and myself, you know, we've all learned a lot from each other uh, in the process. And that really uh, helps, you know, in the development of these algorithms and fine tuning uh, for optimization and optimal um, patient care. So uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra and Jed for joining us. Um, and uh, Michael and Shang for those excellent presentations. So we'll conclude the AI session.